City Training Day at his fellowship at uh, the world-renowned BNI, Dr. Spencer, and then he went on to uh, Australia to the Scopic Fellowship as well. He's come back and is really heir apparent to Dr. Spencer. He's done a phenomenal job. He has over hundreds of publications and book chapters. He's really a technical maestro. He's really lived up to the BNI traditions. Uh, doing great talks and aneurysm, and skull days and endoscopy. Uh, they run, he's now the program director, the work which is the largest neurosurgical training program I think in the world today. They have 48 residents, so, and in one hospital, so I think that's phenomenal. And he's been involved very much in organized neurosurgery with the Academy and the Senior Society and stuff. So we're very fortunate to have time out of the busy schedule to be with us. So without much further ado, Dr. Peter McCullough. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, it's, a, it's a definite uh, pleasure. I think the first time that I saw you was at a course in about 1997, uh, talking about ophthalmic uh, aneurysms. Um, I was very, very uh, junior in that at the time, but just in the early part of my residency. Uh, and I remember being struck uh, uh, by your uh, uh, command of that, and then also because you're a very dapper dresser, I was going to make a comment at the bow tie, but no bow tie today. <laughs> uh, but I do have to say, uh, now at the academy, I've seen you in your biking clothes, so I mean, <laughs> which you cut a good figure, and that's right in line, of course, with us at the barrel. Uh, I I was a little torn about what to talk about, uh, but I thought what I would talk about is about aneurysm surgery, since we're kind of in a, a transition time in aneurysm uh, surgery. And I think that there, when I look back at the body of things that uh, at the Barrow we've had to do in this era, I decided that we have had a lot of opinions <laughs> in this matter. And I would share a little bit of that. Here are my objectives. You're going to see them in the talk. And here are my disclosures. Uh, I have a lot of them, um, but none of them are relevant uh, to this. I think because of our structure at the Barrow, it's easier to have, to be accessible to industry. And I don't think we demonize that too much. I think we manage it pretty well. Um, Everything coming out of the barrel is a team effort, everything. Uh, nobody stands alone. So I have two research fellows. Actually, right now, my research fellows, one of them's not on here, but I have the evil triumvirate. I have, I have China, Russia, and Iran, all. <laughs> I need a North Korean. Uh, fantastic people, really great people. Uh, and then a lot of our residents who, these are just the three of them. Actually, Dave Wilson is now graduated, but uh, did a lot of the work that I supervise that I'll talk to you about. And then actually one of our fellows is going to come out and see you all soon. Um, and then of course the whole uh, group, which is really a collaborative uh, effort. Uh, it's a great group of, of people. Um, you really couldn't want better partners uh, than, than this. And I don't know that every place can say that as honestly as I feel I can. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, aneurysms and particular ruptured aneurysms. Uh, you know all this uh, stuff. Well, one thing I'm going to say is, uh, they say that you really only remember 7% of what you're told. So I'm going to tell you a lot in this, uh, in this hour. Uh, and uh, if it goes too fast, you tell me. Uh, you know all this, but basically that uh, you know, subarachnoid hemorrhage mostly is a very bad disease. I'm a fond of analogies. And I always tell people it's like a house flood. You can fix a broken pipe that doesn't fix the mess after the aneurysm ruptures. And having had a house flood recently and been out for eight months, I can promise you that that is uh, true. But it is, it's one of the worst of the stroke types in general. And uh, really only a small percentage of people return to work. It affects relatively younger people. Now, microsurgery for aneurysms, of course, goes way back. But at the time of Cushing, he thought that these were best left to future experience. And he was right. At his time, it wasn't uh, the right time. Uh, Dandy, as his successor, and somewhat at odds with him, uh, was the first person to actually clip an aneurysm. And clips developed uh, afterwards. The story of this, if you haven't read it, is fantastic about people going and, and basically building these things by hand and trying them out, uh, something we couldn't do nowadays. Um, and of course, over time, it's evolved into what we have today, which is there's really no aneurysm that can't be uh, clipped. And there are all these incredible approaches that we've developed to be able to do all this, uh, including things like bypass and hypothermic circulatory arrest, all of which um, I've had the pleasure at the Barrow to, to do. Um, the real question uh, is about this is when aneurysm surgery became fun. You know, there really was a transition point where aneurysm surgery went from being something that was a ferocious undertaking that everyone came out of sweating to something that we just couldn't wait to do. And I think that's important because 
as we look into the current period, I think that some of the debate has to do with our fondness uh, for this, this uh, pastime. Um, you know, trouble in paradise often comes. Uh, there's always a snake in the garden. In this case, it comes in the form of platinum. Um, endovascular therapy uh, it really starts with Moniz uh, doing angiography, and then a whole series of developments from balloons and then coils. And then uh, naturally, once coiling became uh, popular, competition was bound to strike up. Uh, we don't battle, of course, uh, fisticuffs, you know, in this, but we do it through clinical trials. Um, and uh, this is, a, I would always point out to residents that this is a great way to launch your entire career. Uh, it is a great way to derive a truth of a sort. Uh, it's, it's a truth for whatever you did. It may or may not be an enduring truth, uh, but it can definitely influence uh, practice. Compared to any other study, it is an extraordinary amount of work to do a real prospective clinical trial. Um, the, the biggest thing is don't do all that work without having thought through the design uh, because as I'll show you for a couple of them it, it makes a huge difference in terms of what actually happens. So, but, but you can um, make hay off of this uh, forever. I learned this in residency. My uh, chair way back was Larry Marshall. He did this traumatic coma data bank and he, as far as I know, never had to publish any other papers. He could mine that thing forever. Uh, you know what the goals of aneurysm treatment are. They really are at the beginning to stop uh, hemorrhage and minimize recurrence, sometimes to do some kind of decompression surgery and then minimize the risk of retreatments and nowadays to be cost effective. Uh, and that leads to the question of how to do that nowadays, which is clipper coil. ISAT was the first uh, real shot across the bow that changed everything. And so uh, it is a randomized prospective trial. It has a large number of patients screened. Over 2,000 were enrolled and uh, pretty evenly divided between the two groups. And the primary outcome, which we also all use now, is MRS uh, 0 to 2. And you know the result, which is 23.5 versus 30% in favor of coiling, with an absolute risk reduction of 7.4%, which is a very large relative risk reduction. Uh, the five-year death rate was 11% for endovascular and 14% for clipping, so relative risk of 0.77. That's actually a great advantage um, in, in you know, medicine. Um, the 10-year report uh, is out now, um, which is, uh, again, shows a slight advantage in favor of endovascular, but an odds ratio of 1.35, so clearly with a, you know, a significant confidence interval. So based upon that data, it's clearly a better, um, better outcome. And the general interpretation of this naturally was that anim aneurysm suitable for coiling, uh, coiling should be attempted first and by preference. Okay, so there, I can close up and we'll leave. Um, by inference, uh, this was quickly generalized, you know, to say that therefore coiling as a blanket state was better than uh, for clipping. Uh, and there were a lot of drivers for this, uh, some of which may or may not have to do with the actual outcomes. So um, if you look at the data, it's a little more nuanced, and I'm sure you've discussed this in journal clubs or whatever, but that the, if you look, um, for instance, at the five-year death rates, uh, it doesn't actually translate to any significant difference in functional survivors. The number of functional survivors was the same uh, by the 10 year or by the five year mark. If you look at the 10 year survival, uh, which we already showed that there was an advantage, um, that, that advantage uh, was actually no longer significant. So present is a trend, but not actually significant anymore. And if you look at uh, the issues of this, the trial, which there have been many editorials pointing this out, the delay in treatment was longer for the open group, and the rehemorrhage rate prior to treatment was more, that resulted in more deaths. And in fact, if you looked at uh, excluding those pretreatment deaths, there would have been more deaths at two months in the endovascular group than in the coiling group. So how the trial was conducted uh, greatly influenced uh, things. Um, if you look at the uh, other aspects of it in terms of what we look at today, the retreatment rate was higher with more, or sorry, the rebleed rate was higher for endovascular. And there was absolutely no follow-up for clipping or coiling to determine efficacy. So arguably even a 10-year follow-up is not enough. We may need a 20 or a 30 or a 40-year follow-up because these people may end up needing treatment. And it might be true for clipping too, right? This is a two-tailed two problem. You can't say for sure in advance whether one was better than the other. Uh, the biggest problem, naturally, is that this was 22.4% of patients that went into the trial, which means a large number were excluded. 
Uh, the basilar aneurysms were generally coiled, and there was not felt to be equipoised. The remainder of the aneurysms, a large number of the other ones were actually clipped. Um, and, uh, and I pointed out to the residents earlier when we were talking that equipoise for this trial doesn't mean good for both. It means good for coiling, right? It means a group of subset of people who are good for coiling because every aneurysm was clippable before, right? It wasn't that we would have not clipped them before. We weren't looking for coiling, although I think coiling is still good. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, and this is I think very important, the relative experience and proficiency of the treating physician was different. There was a stringent requirement for experience for coiling, which is ironic because arguably the learning curve for coiling is actually a little bit less than it is for open clipping. And in fact, when you talk to Molyneux later and they look back, a lot of the clippings were done by senior, senior registrars, which is our equivalent of a, of a um, chief resident uh, without supervision at all. Um, even when I was there, uh, in the 90s at Queen Square, they didn't have, in the middle of the night, nobody came. I mean, attendings didn't come to those cases at all. And it does take a while to get better at this. Uh, nonetheless, there's, this is old news, right? Uh, over 90% of aneurysms in places like France are, are being treated endovascularly based upon this small subset, which truly over 50% of the cases came from five centers in England with a very different practice than we're used to. All right. Uh, even if you accept that, that we're going to go with the data, uh, we've started to see problems. I mean, ninety percent of aneurysms. You consider that about thirty-one percent of them are MCA aneurysms. The ISAT data looks at the MC. If you look at the MCA subgroup, now that wasn't how it was designed to be parsed. But if you do parse the data, you discover that the outcome for the clipping patients is fabulously better than it is for the coiling patients. So even using their own data, it isn't justified to coil those aneurysms, and yet that has started to happen as well. Uh, so I would argue that you need a few things to have a better trial. One is more general applicability, and we should be randomizing all subarachnoid hemorrhage, not choosing a subset. Um, and then modality equivalency, meaning that you have what's considered equivalent levels of expertise for both, and then high quality and very consistent and prompt care. We know that there's a re-bleeding rate of about 4% in that first 48 hours, and, or even 24 hours. Um, and so getting out to 1.7 days is really not ideal. Uh, if you think, well, how much of a difference does that make? Well, it makes about a 2% difference between the group that went in 1.1 versus 1.7 uh, days, and that's the difference in outcome for much of the trial. All right, well, at the barrel we come out fighting. So the barrel rupture and aneurysm trial was conceived as an answer to this. This actually started right when I arrived at the barrel. And so I got to be involved in the conduct of the trial, but I was not a treating surgeon because Spencer told me I wasn't experienced enough yet uh, to do it. And so a lot, the cases are not consecutive in the barrow. Uh, when everybody was out of town, which actually turned out to be a decent amount of the time, or there weren't two people who actually just needed to be not a clipper and a coiler who were uh, surgeons at the same time, then, then it was all me. And that was how I got most of my experience in these little bursts in the summer and the winter and meant I was there for every holiday. Every hall, I never left town. The purpose of this was to compare uh, safety of clipping versus coiling, and really for ruptured aneurysm, prospective randomized controlled, meant to be real world. It was whatever came through, any subarachnoid hemorrhage, and definitely intent to treat. I think we told you that. And the normal hypothesis is there's no difference. Everything had to be done within 24 hours, but you could cross over if you wanted to. Everything between 18 to 80, and any subarachnoid hemorrhage was in your group. Uh, as long as it wasn't traumatic. And that naturally meant some over-inclusion, but it also meant you couldn't dodge any case. Uh, the NPs mostly gathered this, entered into a database. We had an independent neuroradiologist, and we checked uh, outcomes at, at discharge 6, 1, 3, 10, and we just authorized, or at 1, 3, and 6 years, we just authorized a 10-year time point, uh, as well as imaging outcomes. And the primary outcome is MRS greater than two. So again, zero to two being good, and three, four, five, six being bad. Um, we did uh, check a number of secondary outcome measures, and the, the outcomes were uh, repeat subarachnoid hemorrhage, retreatment, death, and then general MRS outcome. So um, the way that this really worked was uh, all patients were screened. They were consented by some combination of the residents, attendings, and research nurses. And I would like to point out that really due to an act of tremendous will, virtually everybody was consented. What's important about this is you can argue about the ethics of such a trial, but the reality is I hear people say, well, you can't consent people because they won't do it. 
it isn't true. They will consent mostly to what they're told. Um, and if they're told that there is considered to be equipoise and that you have a trial running, the reality is that they mostly did uh, do so. Uh, they, they began randomized. We tried two, because this was a, a pilot, both simple randomization, meaning uh, they um, uh, came in and just were randomized individually, or we did them in alternating blocks so that we didn't get out of pace uh, with them. And then uh, the data was collected virtually every day as it was generated. So 725 patients were screened, 500 patients were randomized. There were, of course, a few who we couldn't include properly, and that basically broke down like this. So the randomization, uh, once everyone came out, was 237 into clip and 229 into coil. And that is part of the reason we went back to permuted block, because just randomly we were getting off track a little bit. Uh, when you actually broke it down, uh, we extracted all the angio-negative and died before treatment uh, aneurysms to get the treated group. Uh, and that uh, left 209 uh, treated that were ori originally an intent to treat group here and 199 here. And then uh, uh, of that, crossed over 2% from clipping to coiling and crossed over 38% from coiling to clipping, which left this as the ultimate uh, treatment group. Now, on the past slide, intent to treat is the, the primary endpoint of the trial. But naturally, you'd like to know what happened to the group that was actually as treated. So sometimes I'll say intent to treat. That means that as they were randomized, sometimes uh, as treated, and that means what actually happened. Uh, so, and the crossover is really going to be the key. So, um, again, breakdown here. What's important on this slide mostly is that the angio negatives were relatively uh, balanced between the two, enough to not be a significant difference because we know they have a better outcome. Uh, the uh, bad modified Rankin score for this group actually is not perfect. It's 11% at an MRS 3 to 6, which is a little surprising because we think of them as always doing well. Uh, and then secondly, the died before treatment was 3 and 3, so that shouldn't affect the trial. Um, we had a relatively similar number of people in whom data wasn't uh, available for whatever reason, and so that left the group that we just discussed. So here's the big issue. Uh, out of the 209 assigned to clip, 98% were clipped. And out of the 199 assigned to coil, only 62% uh, were coiled. Uh, when you look at them in terms of their statistics, there is no difference between the two groups. Their ages are similar. Uh, the aneurysm size is relatively similar. Um, the, everything else seems to be fairly similar in terms of comorbidities. Uh, but nonetheless, there are reasons why they were crossed over. Um, in various ones. Usually, the endovascular people would say it was configuration, but if you look at the group of people crossed over was, on the whole, uh, I would say more complicated if you look at them one by one. Um, and then, so this creates a problem. So the point of the trial was to compare clipping versus coiling for ruptured aneurysms. However, uh, that's not exactly what happened. As a result of what happened, this is what happened. This is not uh, stated anywhere except by me. And it's one of the advantages of not being in the trial, is what BRAT really tests is whether the policy of selecting patients best suited for endovascular therapy, uh, coiling first, giving them coiling, offers that subset of patients better outcomes than the practice of unselected clipping. Right? It's basically, if you clip everybody, is that better or worse than choosing a group of people? Uh, it does greatly complicate the interpretation. Now I'm going to show you massive amounts of data. And this is the summary data for the trial at six years. And what it shows is that uh, at six months, uh, there is an absolutely significant difference in favor of coiling with a relative risk of, of an odds ratio of 1.88. And at one year, it's at 1.68. And then uh, actually after that, it fades out to non-significance uh, for the group as a whole. Now, you might say, well, that's a relative uh, victory, maybe a little more than we would have expected uh, for clipping, but if you were given the choice between the two, would you want to spend a year catching up, right? And the answer is probably no. And in fact, there's never a time where the odds ratio flips in favor of clipping. So I would say so far we haven't refuted anything. Um, I think we can say that that's true, that it offers an advantage, six months and a year for sure. The problem with this is this, this doesn't look like any other trial, and it's very hard to compare it to anything in terms of real life because this isn't happening anywhere, right? No, nowhere is, is everybody getting clipped. Well, may, there are maybe a few places, but 
it's not the real world. It's not what people are trying to decide. So the question is, can you post hoc try to take something from this that looks like something that would really happen? And I think if we had run the trial again, knowing what we know, we would not do it the same way. We would not have done it the same way, taking uh, everybody because, uh, because of well, what I'm about to show you. So if we look at only anterior circulation saccular aneurysms and exclude all other aneurysm types uh, by intention to treat, that looks most like ISAT. It minimizes the cherry picking part of it and it also minimizes the crossover of the known worst groups, which is mostly posterior circulation and non-saccular aneurysms. The non-saccular aneurysm group, the group that was classified as fusiform, uh, uh, blister uh, aneurysms, and, uh, and mycotic or otherwise abnormal you know, non-saccular aneurysms, did substantially worse. Uh, and the vast majority of that group ended up in the clipping category. So if you look at that and do an anterior aneur uh, circulation, saccular aneurysms by location, you find that actually they're amazingly matched uh, between the two groups, almost surprisingly so. Um, and when you look at this, um, suddenly everything is gone. There is no, not even close uh, to a significance between the two groups. At no time point is there a significant difference to them uh, as assigned. So even uh, taking the opportunity to pass off the ones that you don't think you can coil best, it didn't actually result in this. And the best defense, and naturally our endovascular guys are very smart and tough guys, they don't take this lying down. Their best argument is that wasn't how the trial was designed. It wasn't how the trial was designed, you can't go back and ask a question a different way, which is actually fairly valid. Uh, one important thing here, and this is more for understanding trial design, this CF means carry forward. Carry forward is very important because if you note, we started with 339 and we could only find at some time points less. In fact, we found more of the, well, yeah, we found actually with every time point uh, less, actually more at one year than we found at six months. What carry forward does is it takes the worst assumption. So let's say we can't find it and we assume that everybody did worse in both groups, right? That everybody we couldn't find was dead. That doesn't uh, change it either way. Um, the, uh, if you look at uh, the, the number of patients by actual treatment, same problem. There is no, no uh, difference between the two groups. And that's having lumped a lot of patients into the uh, clipping group that were cherry picked and, and left over and it was a worse uh, group. I actually hand reviewed every single crossover uh, patient and it was, uh, it was not a group that you would want to put into your trial up front. And the poster circulation was a little more complicated and that was because uh, first of all there was a massive number of pica aneurysms in the clip assigned group uh, compared to the um, coil assigned group. Uh, everything else was uh, relatively uh, similar but, uh, but this was this was highly disproportionate. And there is no question, no, you can't slice this data anyway to not make it look like it's better to be coiled if you have a posterior circulation aneurysm in general, in general. Um, this, uh, if you look at how different these are, so 31% versus 62.9%, it's a massive difference. I don't have the odd ratios here, but they're terrible. They're 2.31, you know. Uh, it's very clearly worse for posterior circulation aneurysms. Um, and if you look by actual treatment, uh, it actually gets, well, no better. Um, so the actual treatment or assigned, it, you were better off uh, in the coiling group. Um, if you look at the non-pica aneurysms, interestingly, and this is completely not anywhere else in literature, and we don't know what exactly to make of it because, well, you guys showed me a pica aneurysm today, and I get pica aneurysms, and we would have routinely before thought that they were about the same. Uh, the non-pica aneurysm group does almost twice as well as the pica aneurysm group in our study. And the variety of reasons why that happens uh, in terms of quality of life, they have a lot of other problems. Um, they have some catastrophic outcomes, but a lot of them just are not better. They, they have uh, persistent problems with hydrocephalus, uh, swallowing disorder, speech disorder, you know, lower cranial nerve dysfunction, what have you. And I have to say some of it must come partly from surgery because because it's just in that group. Um, so the takeaway at this point, interestingly, is that if you have an anterior circulation aneurysm, there is no difference. In fact, in fact, the clipping group, I switched these columns here, but the clipping group uh, is actually doing slightly better, in, in insignificantly better, I should point out, uh, than the coiling group at six years. Uh, the posterior circulation aneurysms, no, no, no two ways about it. Uh, they, they are better off if they were coiled. 
in terms of retreatment, or in terms of, uh, yeah, retreatment, uh, the big number is right here, and that is that 4.7% uh, of the clipping group had to be retreated and 13.3% had to be coiled. I will point out that the MRS of the retreatment group was not negatively affected ever by retreatment. They had to be retreated, but it never caused morbidity. I don't think there's a single case of it. And I think that's pretty much what all the aneurysm studies for coiling have shown, that while the rate of retreatment is higher, the, the negatives of retreatment seem to be minimal other than cost and the psychological burden for the patient. Uh, and an aneurysm obliteration will be of no surprise um, that uh, at every time point, obliteration was better for the clip group than the coiled uh, group when read by an, you know, uh, a radiologist. And that's not too surprising. And these numbers are not far off, I think, from what you see in the general uh, literature. Um, there are some groups that we figured would be in the anterior circulation would be more likely to be advantageous for one modality versus the other. Uh, the MCA group was the obvious group, but it was so small in the group that got coiled that it was not meaningful. Uh, the ACOM group was 130 patients uh, uh, in that group. Uh, there were actually more males than females by a healthy margin, which is unusual for aneurysms as a whole. Uh, the average one was 5.8 millimeters, and I think that's what we see. We were discussing today whether you clip smaller aneurysms in the post issue world, and the answer is it does seem to be that there's still a substantial risk. Most ruptured aneurysms are smaller than the supposed breakpoint for risk. Uh, in the end, because a crossover is a lot more clipped than coiled, which I think is not at all the practice uh, outside of the trial. Um, and once again, no difference uh, at any time point. Uh, it, it, you can all, even there at discharge, there wasn't a, a difference for those. So at least in our center with, I think, highly talented endovascular people, and, and they really were careful during the trial not to treat anything that they didn't think they could get their best result on against clippers, even in that subgroup, we didn't see a, an advantage. So I think it's interesting uh, because, it, you know, it does meet a lot of the requirements that we would want in the trial to at least open, again, the question between the two modalities. Uh, this is also by actual treatment to show that it wasn't just the intent to treat, but the, the treatments rendered also never were significantly different between the two groups. So no different than the other two groups. We continue to go through the data. So I would just challenge the thought that there, the two are probably closer than we thought. There's certainly a trend favors coiling for the whole group, but for individual aneurysms, we think that the question is still fairly wide open. Um, and certainly close enough that the crossovers alone could overwhelm the benefit, uh, sorry, that should be enough for coiling, and that this is possible and practical uh, to do. Uh, and I think there are socioeconomic reasons, or at least economic reasons, coming why we might have to reopen part of this debate. I'll get to the end. Uh, I think that figuring out the subgroups is going to be really key uh, to know. Uh, I would also point out that it may be that there are other analyses, including if this trial is ever done again, there will be a large neuropsych component, because one of the arguments for the coiling group is that there is more neuropsychological impact, and that might be true, and if so, it might be a, 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 you know, a reason. The MRS is not that sensitive. So, so what actually happened as a result for us? Well, <laughs> no different than you might expect. Uh, the coilers and the clippers both are completely convinced, but not of the same thing. Uh, the endovascular group feels mostly vindicated that endovascular therapy is the, should have right of first refusal. Uh, and right now we are currently stuck at alternating right of first refusal by day. Uh, we, we alternate on uh, given days uh, who gets to choose first. Uh, since the trial, I would say we're more likely to, to give people to coiling than we were before, and they are less likely to send people back to clipping. However, Spetzler has done, I don't have that data, a little analysis of outcomes, and outcomes have not improved as a result of that change in practice. So very interesting, I think. Um, so the, the reason why I think this is important is because there's so many people going to a dual train, they would never have this debate, right? This debate comes because there are two of us or three of us who clip and two of us who coil, and they don't do the other thing. Otherwise, we would just choose. But in fact, I would say this is a bad problem because the reason then that you choose as an individual, you don't have any push or pull, right? You choose for reasons that are completely internal and you don't have a chance to evaluate what your outcomes would have been if you had done the other thing. So I think it's just something worth thinking about um, off of that data. There are plenty of things still for us to do. I have a very busy open practice even in this setting. I mean, most middle cerebral artery aneurysms are, are clipped. Um, a lot of the wide-necked ones, especially if they end up needing, if they wouldn't need a stent, you know, that doesn't happen. If they need a balloon, that's not really a problem. 
Uh, we do all the posterior communicating arteries with aneurysms with third uh, nerve compression. It's not a huge number, but a lot. We do most giant aneurysms, although more of the paraophthalmic, I would say, are getting coiled nowadays. Uh, they are working on the very small aneurysms, uh, but uh, generally we will be clipping those. But it, I would also say it's aneurysm by aneurysm if the configuration is right for coiling. Blister aneurysms is an ongoing uh, issue. Um, it's one of my bet noir uh, because it's, a, it's definitely a problem. Um, fusiform aneurysms naturally uh, come to us, and the, it, interestingly, multiple, unless they're all coilable, uh, generally we will end up operating on them to figure out which one is ruptured to make sure that they're all treated. So that's about 50-50 now. Uh, I don't think that that's probably the trend in most places. It sounds like nowadays it's at least 60-40 and really 70-30 or even 80-20 to endovascular or a lot of places. Uh, but I would say it's worth uh, revisiting it. Um, in Canada, uh, so this is Mike Timiansky's data which he shared. They uh, have a policy of endovascular right of first refusal. And they had a prospective database where they looked at 100 clipped and 100 coiled unruptured aneurysms. Um, and uh, there was a difference in location, so I don't think it's purely comparable. Um, but if, if you were looking at this from a clipper point of view, you'd be perfectly happy because these aneurysms tend to take a hell of a lot more time, pardon me, a heck of a lot more time uh, than these aneurysms do. But in fact, in their setting, of course, you have to add a zero to every cost in the United States compared to this. But in the Canadian, uh, you know, dream world, uh, in fact, microsurgery there was faster, conclusion was better, morbidity was less, nobody needed to be crossed over, and the, um, the median cost was half. Um, and this is something uh, around the world you see it. In fact, at the WFNS at the last meeting in, uh, in Korea, there were a bunch of talks about this, the problem of endovascular because it's so much more expensive. You don't want to think about it here in the United States because we really, we give lip service to it, we don't really care about cost a great deal, frankly. Uh, but in the rest of the world, the cost of the coils and the equipment is, is the overwhelming uh, cost of the procedure. Uh, in Korea or in China, they just say, if you have money, you can get coiled. If you don't have money, uh, you get, and I think in India, it's often the same, same policy, right? Um, they haven't even entered the debate about which one they should have had, so. Well, uh, I'm not going to hammer that anymore, but I would like to point a couple things about the BRAT trial that I think would be of usefulness also if you're launching your career, which is this. You never let an orchard still bearing fruit go unpicked, right? This trial, uh, when it finished and there was a lot of rancor between um, the, you know, the endovascular and the open people, uh, I just looked at it and said, my God, there's so much we haven't even begun to do. So we began to just serial out studies. And out of them came a lot of interesting things. So I generated something called the BRAT add-on database. It, we added on retrospectively a ton of points that weren't in and hit some more questions um, that were not part of the primary study. And uh, I'm gonna show you some of those. So here's one, and I give a lot of credit to my resident Dave Wilson, who is now in practice in competition with us in our own town. He's a fantastic uh, guy. He, somewhere along the line, uh, has shacked up with one of our mid-level residents uh, who, <laughs> who he was the chief when she was a junior. I'm glad I didn't know, um, but uh, it's all fine. They're both fantastic uh, people. So uh, we noted that we've been following the Fisher scale and when we did the Brandt trial, we noticed that 99% uh, of people are a Fisher three, unless you interpret Fisher four in a way that's not in the paper. Um, and it was supposed to describe the severity of SAH and natural and vasospasm risk. I'm sure you used the Fisher scale here. Um, and this is the way it works, no blood, I don't even know what this means. Thin blood with vertical layers of blood less than one millimeter thick. Uh, this is almost everybody. And uh, this is really not common either, except for occasionally an ACOM aneurysm MCA that bleeds into the parenchyma. Um, and in what he saw was everybody who had blood like this had at least some kind of spasm. Well, nobody else did. And nobody's ever seen data like that again either. So here's the problem, Fisher one never happens. Two and three in that system, if it's mild, you, you can't tell the difference between a mild three and a two. Uh, this is a very broad category, which is not meaningful, and this is not really meaningful. Um, so if you look at all these and grade them, honestly, every single one of them is a grade three. However, what we looked at and said is, could we tell a difference between them if we had a different grading system? And so we went and just figured out what we could do with that. And so we would like one that's stratified by vasospasm risk from low to high in a kind of a linear fashion. And we'd like to know whether these things matter, ICH, IVH, and all that. 
And uh, so when going to that, what we discovered was uh, ICH and IH do not, and, and I think you've all seen this, it doesn't really increase your risk of vasospasm. If the clot is all within blood and not around the blood vessels, it doesn't. Uh, so that's not a meaningful part of the scale. Uh, but the amount of blood in the subarachnoid phase does, and the more blood there is, the greater the risk. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but there's no way to quantify it. Uh, and so that the Fisher three category needs to be parsed out further. So this is the new scale. And I was really happy at the CNS to have been stopped by somebody from Mass General who told me they've been using it for the last couple of years and their data looks exactly like our data. So BNI1 is equivalent to one and two. Uh, uh, BNI2 is real easy. It's five, 10, five, uh, less than five, up to 10, 10 to 15, greater than 15. Simple. It's all done on cross-section. I couldn't even find a good uh, example of a Fisher 1 or of a BNI1. A BNI2 is this. Blood on cross-section, the widest spot, uh, you know, looking at a true perpendicular, not a, not a sulcus like that, uh, less than five. A two would be a wider section. You, people argue about this, that how can you tell between a 10 and 11 millimeters thick, but the reality is if you go and you do it, it's actually not hard to, to decide if you're really more in one. Most fall in the middle of a category. So it was like that. There's a wider area clot, and again, it's maximal thickness. Uh, and or like that. And if you do it, this is what you find in terms of vasospasm, a beautiful line. And again, this is drawing off of uh, fairly robust data. This is all brand prospectively gathered uh, data in terms of spasm. So uh, the um, odds ratio comparing to the one group, uh, no difference actually between two and one. So meaning two is a relatively low risk group. It was not going to be difference, but every other group uh, becomes significant in increasing fashion with odds ratio of 3.29, 4.9, and up to 12.2. So I think highly useful by comparison to Fisher. If we're going to bother to measure one, I would argue that this kind of a scale um, is, is much more uh, useful. So very simple and reproducible, uh, very single, uh, very simple uh, with a single measurement, uh, and much more accurate. So I hope that you at least think about that one. Um, we looked at hydrocephalus in this trial, and probably the big thing is there was actually no difference in the shunting rate for clipping and coiling. I don't think it's easy to draw conclusions from this because the reason to, to shunt or not shunt is so subjective. Um, the interesting thing about it was that we were shunting up to a third of our people, which is higher than a lot of studies. Um, uh, there was a difference between the two groups, with a little bit more in the clipping, but it was not significant. Uh, the, um, the real thing was if you had interventricular hemorrhage or, or intraparenchymal hemorrhage, both of those significantly increased your risk of being shunted. Uh, but intraoperative rupture, for instance, uh, did not, and the type of an uh, aneurysm did not, and actually fourth ventricular blood didn't, which I thought was kind of interesting. The other thing that was interesting about it was uh, if you needed a shunt, so if you got a shunt, your chance of returning to work or to self-care was worse. Um, so you'd think to yourself, well, that would get them better. In fact, I think what it really shows is if you need a shunt, you're in worse shape than the people who don't need a shunt. So if you don't need a shunt, you're lucky. Uh, so this appears to be association, not causation. Uh, the people with worse hemorrhages were more likely to need shunting, not, it wasn't, it wasn't that the shunt made them worse. Another thing that we observed, which I think was very interesting, uh, and it just shows you how much you have to dig into things, is this, which is the time course of recovery. So, I think everybody has this situation where um, someone says to you, um, you know, how is my family member going to do, right? Are they going to get better? And you don't know the answer to that question. And then uh, I used to tell them 12 weeks. If they're not better in 12 weeks, things aren't looking good. So it turns out that if you look at the aggregate MRS scores for the poor grade, these are grade four and five patients at presentation, uh, the um, MRS scores, uh, slightly improve over time. Um, but they, if you look amongst themselves, they really didn't. So at discharge, they were terrible, 4.33, but then they slightly improved over time. Eventually, this is better than this, uh, but the trend is hard to see. So um, between discharge and six months, 61% of people did improve to some degree. Uh, and then the subsequent improvements were 18 to 19%. Uh, they, uh, if you were uh, four is a lot better than being five. Um, if you had a big stroke uh, or an eloquent region stroke, that was worse, and your chance it was worse. Uh, and then this continued on. What's really interesting about this is none of this. It's this. 
after a year, some patients kept improving, so that, that they significantly improved. And the, let's see, actually, was it there or the, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's the, uh, if you were young or started out as a grade four instead, uh, and you didn't have any of these other negative CT factors, then even though the aggregate for the group, so if you look at the group as a whole, it, it, by a year it had evened out, um, the question was what would you tell someone if this was what the scatter plot looked like? The best they're likely to do is this, some of them are going to do this, and the average is this. It turned out the real scatter plot looks like this. Some people do continue to do worse. They don't get better, and by a year they start to run out of steam and they get worse. But some people keep getting better a year later. Uh, and so for a lot of people, if you tell them 19 out of 88 people were going to convert to an MRS of 0 to 2, meaning a good outcome, if you just give them time, it totally changes the discussion. I mean, I think it really does. If you have a child or a young person, wait a year, wait two years, because they might indeed convert. So this has changed our view, and I think, honestly, we're keeping a lot more of the grade fours. Uh, there's a Nakaji rule at the BNI, which is bet with the MRI. We get a prognostic MRI. If we find no big areas of damage, um, you know, physical damage, uh, and everything else looks okay, we, we send them off to wait, and a substantial proportion of people get better. Um, and it's funny, our neurologists told us that they don't get better, and they, so they don't do it, and they encourage the families to you know, work on withdrawal of care. And I say, how do you know they don't get better? They, they just don't get better. Have you followed them out to find out? No. Well, then, <laughs> then you obviously don't know. The answer is they do get better, a lot of them. Um, so that, I think, it was the kind of data you can get out. We have a whole bunch of other studies on, on uh, seizures and vasospasm and everything else, and I'll show you not much of that, actually, more because I think I've hit that. Uh, there, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other things we have derived from our own data. Um, challenging areas. So one of them is PC aneurysms, and this is another one where it was kind of surprising to us. We discovered that the group of people who got bypassed and trapped, um, or bypassed and sacrificed endovascular, which was our standard approach, actually did substantially worse than the group of people who could either be primarily clipped uh, or um, uh, just sacrificed. Your chances were much better if they did a balloon test occlusion and you could just sack the vessel uh, to treat the aneurysm, or if we could go in and somehow reconstruct it, uh, than if you needed the combined uh, treatment. And for a variety of reasons. One of them being a lot of people, once they got to the coiling and trapping, uh, or the, the coiling phase, uh, got put on anticoagulation and bled uh, from their prior surgery. I mean, a substantial number, too much to account for just chance. So that has actually affected our approach. Uh, to some degree. Um, uh, this group, I think, is a difficult group. And I think everybody, this is the group, would you say, that we were all hoping pipeline was the, the treatment for. I mean, we looked at it and just said, OK, we're going to lose this group for open treatment. Fantastic. Nobody was going to weep too hard about that. Um, these were a high uh, risk for everything. They had difficult treatments. Um, but actually, we know now from the Buffalo group, I think I credit their honest uh, publication that they had terrible results uh, with this particular group. We do explore non-thrombosed ones uh, now and even do circulatory rest for those, but it's rare now to do that. Um, it, it's very, it, when I first arrived, we were doing six to eight circulatory rests a year, and then now it's almost none. Um, the thrombosed ones are a real problem, as I'll show in a minute. Uh, these are the kind of strategies, you know, you can clip off the basilar uh, below and do a bypass. Um, you can, uh, uh, and bring that into either uh, PCA or SCA. Uh, you can actually go and clip below one pica and above one pica and use flow reversal. That's something that we have done um, and done a variety of additional bypasses. Um, when you slow down things too much, uh, they often thrombose and you will see a disaster. We often say reversal of flow is reversal of fortune. Uh, it's, a, it's a high risk group. One of our residents, we have a very uh, productive resident, Dr. Kalani who uh, looked at us, and he looked at a whole bunch of these aneurysms. Uh, they were treated with occlusion of the basilar, either partial or both vertebral arteries, as I just showed. <clears throat> and uh, what we mostly saw was that they had a better uh, pre-op MRS score than a follow-up, although the group not treated also did worse. In fact, just like uh, the other data, like the FOX data has shown, over five years, a lot of them are dead if you do nothing. Um, but uh, so, oh, let's see, where is that? 
Yeah, if you look at what happened in terms of, of uh, the treatment, so two of them died as a result of their operations or, or the subsequent healing period. And then of the remainder, uh, five uh, uh, total died because th four or more of them continued to grow, had retreatment, and three of those died. So if you have to come to second round treatment, 75% died. Um, what this basically means is that you're rolling the dice. If you did treatment, then you may enter a group of people who has a better long-term survival, but you do it at great peril. And it's not for everybody to make that choice. Um, we've been doing computational flow uh, dynamics. And the interesting thing about this is, you know, low shear is actually worse than high shear. Normal vessels should be under high shear. And we've been doing this to model what would happen if we closed a vessel or opened a vessel or bypassed a vessel. And it turns out that our ability to predict that compared to what the computer tells us is terrible. Uh, that in some of these aneurysms, it would be better actually to increase the flow through them. Uh, than and get laminar flow back uh, than to, to uh, do what we would have done. Uh, this is with David Frakes, uh, and it's, uh, hopefully we'll generate more rational interventions in the future. We have a grant uh, to, to look at that now. Um, vasospasm continues to be an issue. Yes, I keep hearing people say they don't have vasospasm. Do you have vasospasm? Right. Yeah, we have tons of it. I, I talked to Senator, they oh no, we don't have too much. But I know someone visited Yazergill years ago and said that he said, we don't have that either. But some patients, about 10 days after surgery, get hemiplegic. So, uh, you know, we don't really understand this. As you know, nemotopine doesn't really decrease angiographic vasospasm, but it does improve outcome slightly. Clazosentan, which looked like a great thing, you know, the endothelins look like the key, uh, did decrease vasospasm, but didn't improve outcome. So it makes it a little complicated. I mentioned Dr. Kalani before. He's an absolute whirlwind of a, a, a guy. Um, who uh, uh, put in for a large grant with the NIH, looking at microRNAs, so exosomal microRNAs. Uh, Ten years ago, there was no such field. It turns out that the body sheds little tiny vesicles with very short microRNAs in it that have incredible regulatory functions throughout the body, and it does it fast. Within 15 minutes of an injury, often, they're, they're spread throughout the body. Um, and we know that some people who uh, have uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in the ENOS gene, for instance, have an increased risk of vasospasm. So we know that there's a genetic uh, opportunity here. And so we thought that if we looked at these, we might find a profile through large, uh, you know, high throughput screening. Uh, so we went ahead and, and got this grant um, to basically take CSF and blood and look for these microRNAs. Um, uh, we were very happy when we got this. I have to give Dr. Klani a great, uh, uh, well, deserve credit because he coordinated the sites. We did this with Phoenix Children's Hospital looking at interventricular hemorrhage um, and uh, uh, looking at head trauma and then looking at subarachnoid hemorrhage and the total grant funded for four and a half million dollars over five years, uh, which was pretty good. Uh, so we, we uh, started doing this and the interesting thing about this was uh, if you look at between day and two, day seven, uh, you find that uh, microRNA 92 there are only about a thousand of these microRNAs, so it's, a, it's actually a very digestible number. Um, regulates uh, ENOS, so uh, nitrous oxide synthase, and that the rate drops uh, in the microRNA. Now, this is the interesting thing is, most of these are inhibitory, so the actual insult comes early, and then you develop the problem, and then it goes away, the inhibition goes away, and then you cure the problem, but there's a lag in that, and that's exactly why the time course of, of this is probably as it is. We know that the levels uh, drop before the problem starts. Um, and in fact, if you do this blindly, so this was generated by our, our group over at TGen or the Center for Translational Genomics. They didn't know which group was which. And this is the heat map they gave us. And this is the spasm group. And this is the snow spasm group. Nobody fell out. Pretty good. That rarely happens. Uh, this might allow us to predict. And so it could be a, a therapeutic opportunity as well, because these actually are something that uh, drugs could be made to eventually. All right. I'm going to spend last few minutes just talking about this, uh, which is what I think is really uh, a perspective I hope is maybe different coming from the barrel. So we entered co-management, um, which a lot of you in your careers may face uh, coming up, which is where the physicians are engaged to run the place. You don't actually own it, but you are running it. Um, and it has given me daily insights I never thought. Coming from UC San Diego, I had no idea how anything financial or economic works. So this has been uh, challenging. So if you read neurosurgery just last month, you'd know that uh, that volume is an issue. Uh, the, using a stroke registry, they looked at uh, an average of 8.5 per hospital, and they looked at the highest quartile group, 
and the lowest quartile group and the outcomes uh, were much lower if you were in a high quartile center versus a lower quartile center. So your odds ratio, now remember, we're fighting between clipping and coiling between a few percent difference. This is a massive difference uh, just between which hospital you went to. Forget whether you got clipped or coiled. Uh, and in fact, the guidelines, and this is reinforcing what uh, the 2012 Stroke uh, Association, American Heart Association guidelines says, which is when they looked, the death rate in a low volume hospital was 39% versus 27%. I just told you that the average in that study was 8.5 uh, managed per year. And in fact, what they say is anyone with less than 10 a year should be immediately transferred to a place with 35 or more a year. This, if we had a single payer system, this would already have been done a long time ago. Uh, because that actually is our best way to get good outcome. Now here's the reality, uh, and we have seen this amazingly, is under the Affordable Care Act, everyone is responsible for a group of patients, so they do not want to send those patients out. And they are not actually penalized for getting worse outcomes. They're only penalized if their outcome gets worse year on year. So if you started with a terrible outcome because you never transferred those patients out, and you keep getting the same bad outcome, or you slightly improve on your bad outcome, you're fine. And so there's actually almost no incentive for anyone uh, to do this. Everyone wants to be a stroke center. The DRG is very good for this. They, they like it. Um, in terms of aneurysm care in general, I'm, I'm often in this discussion because I counsel everybody who wants to do vascular to be dual trained. Um, after all, there's you know, tons going on. Everyone wants to do it. There are a lot of fellowships. Um, Dave Fiorella wrote a very good article with Pascal Jabour about are we training too many fellows? And they pointed out that there's an actually already only nine aneurysms per endovascular person if you actually average all the people who have training. So um, I just told you that <laughs> you have to have more than this. So, so here we are. Uh, and really what this tells us is that there will be more surgeons and more centers and lower standards and why we really should have fewer surgeons, fewer centers and uh, higher standards. Um, all right. Um, Vern Fennell, uh, who is going to be one of our fellows coming up from the University of uh, Arizona Tucson, looked at a study of, uh, of academic uh, centers and ruptured and unruptured aneurysm. This is great stuff. This was the uh, cerebrovascular award-winning abstract from the AANS in the spring. It's not yet published. Um, and what he showed was that if you look um, at the overall complication rate, unruptured naturally had a much lower complication rate than ruptured, and these are the mortality. But if you go to specialty, the neurologist uh, complication rate, morbidity and mortality was 11.1 .1 and 3.0, 34 and 14. Radiologists had almost half the rate and a lower uh, mortality and neurosurgeons had even a lower and it was all statistically significant comparing groups. Um, and you know, equally so for ruptured aneurysm, substantial difference. So not only should you be transferred to a large volume center, but you actually have to be transferred to someone of a certain specialty. Um, and uh, if you look uh, at this, it really is starkly uh, different in terms of the rates of complication uh, depending on your specialty. Um, now this, I always tell the neurosurgeon they get smug about this, uh, but in fact what you really see is neurosurgeons do more volume than the other two, and that's uh, a big part of why this probably is. Uh, if you look what's happening in trending volume though, volume is trending up for neurology. So at some point, if these two lines cross, it's not unreasonable to think that these outcomes will cross too. It's a function of, of your volume and your experience. Um, so you think to yourself as neurosurgeon, we should be quite smug, we have the better outcomes. So this is one thing I learned about negotiating with insurance companies. They don't care what we charge and they don't care how people do. This is shocking, but I'm just gonna say it in this group that they don't care about those two things. They don't care how much you charge as long as you charge everyone else the same. As long as everybody's paying the same, they're not disadvantaged in getting subscribers. The fact that the rate is high is annoying, but of minor concern. All they don't want is if you go to Cigna, you don't charge Sigma more than you charge Blue Cross because then they can't get subscribers. And they also don't care exactly how you do as long as it doesn't prevent subscribers from joining up. If their rate is so much worse that nobody would sign up for that insurance, that's what they care about. Um, it's a little bald, but it's actually true. So it turns out to the administration, the cheapest endovascular person they can hire is the best, and the rate of hiring of neurologists who are cheaper than hiring radiologists, who are cheaping the hiring neurosurgeons, is increasing faster than that other chart. Actually, there will be more neurologists coiling than neurosurgeons very soon. There are more neurologists in training now. And most of them are being trained by people who have the lowest volume and have been doing it for the least amount of time. 
All right, I'm going to give just fly through this because I know I'm at my time. But uh, the one thing this tells us about clipping is we have to be better uh, to be even competitive in this game. Uh, one of my heroes, Charlie Drake, uh, just points out that if we could have only learned these things and kept them from his rather extraordinary system of vertebral basilar aneurysms, we really do have to do that. Um, we use a variety of, of ways to learn. Um, a lot of these can be learned in the lab. We're trying to find cheap ways to do it around the world. Um, Marcelo Magaldi from Brazil introduced us to the placental model. Uh, it turns out that every country is generating placentas. Um, and they're free and they get thrown away. And they turn out to be the most tissue, have the highest tissue fidelity of any model I've ever seen. You can turn them into aneurysms, you can turn them into carotids, you can turn them into bypass models. Absolutely fantastic. All these things are important uh, because you need way, a way to get more experience and climb the learning curve earlier. Uh, in fact, the average uh, vascular cases are only 103 for a graduating resident. It's not close to enough what you need to do to practice uh, as a vascular neurosurgeon. Um, you really need to be excellent, not just okay in vascular. There are a lot of specialties where I think if you're okay, you're probably okay. There's not a huge, there's a difference, but not a huge difference between somebody who's pretty good and somebody great. Not really true for vascular. It's still brittle. So I'd say that more study, more time in the lab, more multidisciplinary training, more simulation. Probably we should start concentrating cases and people are actually going to do vascular. Uh, it's, I, I don't even like that because I think they learn a lot of good skills just doing it. We should probably have fewer people doing it and they should be training longer and maybe we should require fellowships. Um, this is what I tell my residents. I only expect them to be like these people, nothing much, right? Uh, they have to be extraordinary teamwork, extraordinary individual effort, be willing to risk their lives, be willing to go back for every man, you know, struggle for everything. Um, so that is the note on which I'm gonna leave you. Basically, this just summarizes what I've already said, which is I think clipping may be better than we think. You need both naturally. Coiling is making clipping harder, and so you actually have to be better, and you're doing that with less experience uh, now. And training, therefore, should be concentrated in fewer people in higher volume practitioners at higher volume centers. Uh, but naturally, it's not the treatment. One thing to remember is someday there will be a pill, and no aneurysm will be clipped or coiled. We'll drop some little spaceship into the bloodstream, and we'll go and we'll fix the aneurysm. And so if we're too stuck on the treatment, uh, then, then we'll be lost. And the other thing is that some of these will be socioeconomic, not medical. Thank you for letting me go over by a few minutes. We're open to questions. Yeah, happy to answer any, yeah, any questions or thoughts. Or you know, my question, one of the questions yeah. I had, you know, I like to open the laminar terminalis for all I yes. communicate. Did you find that subset where you open the laminar terminalis, the need for shunting was less? We didn't track it, and we should have. You know that there was a recently a, a relatively large series that where they didn't show any advantage. Um, Spets always does it, even non aneurysms that uh, it's not necessarily an ACOM. He'll run over and do it. I do it a lot of the time. I think it helps during surgery, um, but it's. I suppose the argument is is that when it falls closed, it's not open anymore, right? When the when everything when the frontal lobe comes back down, and in fact, from doing. Um, uh, from doing end endoscopy, you can see that that's the case. A lot of people don't have the right anatomy. That being said, one of our fellows uh, who just uh, finished recently um, uh, went uh, to Mexico and trained with a guy who does um, flexible neuroendoscopy, and he opened the lamina terminalis from the, from the ventriculostomy side, basically with a, a current. And he was able to get a lot of people uh, with a so-called anterior ETV uh, to be treated just like if you had done a traditional one. So it should be possible. But yeah, I don't, we don't have the data, unfortunately. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, congratulations, the excellency. We really appreciate it. On behalf of the department, we have a little. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it.